Hey guys, how you doing? Um, all right, so we're gonna do our second personality uh, chapter. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to play my musical choice. I, I was thinking about playing it at the beginning of this video, but that seemed a little like, excessive. Uh, but it's a uh, a song called "The End" by The Doors. Um, if you want, go on YouTube, check it out. Uh, but the reason I actually picked that song was because of a famous story kind of surrounding it, or, or I should actually say a controversy set off by the lyrics at the end of the song. Um, Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors, was known to be very provocative. He was also very much interested in human psychology, and he'd read uh, a fair amount of Sigmund Freud, and at the end of the song, The End, he's, he's describing a serial killer, basically, or a killer, I guess, who has returned to their family home and is essentially killing members of the family. So you get a sense that it's already pretty provocative. Um, so he kills his father at some point in the song, and then at the end finds his mother and screams out, um, that basically he would like to have intimate relationships, relations with his mother. Uh, so obviously a very provocative thought, very provocative idea, and stolen completely from Sigmund Freud. Uh, and of course this generated all sorts of publicity and, and um, to a band, but publicity is a good thing. Uh, sometimes even sort of negative publicity of a sort. Um, and Jim did not mind being provocative. So. Um, that's why I chose that song. You will see the relevance as we go through. So let's jump in. First of all, why Freud? Well, why Freud in a personality chapter, I guess. Um, obviously, Freud's going to be relevant to the clinical chapter when we come to it, and, and we'll come back to that. Uh, but he also, a lot of his theories focused on early childhood, the experiences of early childhood, and how they could shape one's personality. So he was the first to really have theoretical descriptions of the development of personality. And as suggested by what I just said, he very much focused on environmental influences. So not genetics, but rather things that can happen to you as a child um, and, and the effect that can have on you, but, but also stages of development, almost Piaget-like. Um, stages that people go through uh, as their personality develops and how problems going through these certain stages can ultimately reveal themselves in personality traits that continue throughout life. So that's why he's here. All right, so let's, let's just back up a little bit then. Um, I think we've spoken about Freud a fair amount, but just again to put him in context, um, he was trained as a physiologist. Um, and he was trained to observe very carefully. And in fact, if there's one thing people will, um, to a person, say about Freud, is he was an amazing observer of human behavior. So um, he, he would be very good at watching people, and he formed a bunch of theories to explain the behavior he saw. Um, he was fascinated by ailments that seemed to have no physiological cause. So he would sometimes have someone come into his office that had some issue. He would do a whole physiological makeup and he would conclude that there was nothing in fact physically wrong with them. And so, you know, the thing that really made Freud Freud is that he started to consider the fact that maybe there could be psychological conflicts that were kind of like viruses that resided somewhere deep in a person's subconscious, but that could give rise to symptomology, uh, that is behaviors. Uh, and, and so psychology is causing what look like physical symptoms. Uh, that was you know, what really marked him as exceptional and what really started the whole study of what we now call clinical psychology. Um, you know, given this interest, he was fascinated by the work that Ch Charcot was doing on hypnotism. <clears throat> Quick primer on, on um, Charcot and, and, and Mesmer before him. Uh, Mesmer, by the way, was also a doctor. He was also getting interested, like Freud, in these conditions that seem to have no physical bearing. Uh, one of the new discoveries at the time was magnetism. And, and magnets are kind of magic, right? They're kind of cool and weird how they attract and repel each other um, and so nobody understood magnets very well mesmer especially thought that maybe that magnetic energy had healing powers 
And so he would um, originally ask people to, to go into pools, think of it like a hot tub, and he would insert magnetic rods into the water with you. And he believed this magnetism could help his patients heal. And in fact, that's exactly what he found. Uh, and so early on, it was really about magnetism. But then as time went by, people realized the magnets aren't really doing anything. Um, but what is doing anything is the suggestion, the fact that Mesmer believed the magnets would do something, um, and that he expressed this belief to patients and made them believe it would do something. That seemed to have the powerful healing abilities, at least on some disorders. So we kind of think of that as like a placebo effect nowadays, but early on that was the birth of hypnosis, suggestion. The idea that if you tell people things in a certain way, they're more likely to believe you and they're more likely to do or engage in things you ask them to do. So from Mesmer went to Charcot who started you know, using hypnosis, not all the pools and the magnetic fields, but rather more just hypnosis itself um, to try to cure people who seem to have these psychological ailments. Freud also picked that up. He worked with Charcot, picked that up. That made him even more convinced that the mind can affect the body. Um, and, you know, that really helped march him on the way. Ultimately, he rejected hypnosis as a, as a treatment, um, but he certainly found it a very impressive example of, of the power of the mind. Um, as suggested here, he did eventually come to believe that everything we do is motivated by what he called instinctual desires that provide psychic energy. So, so sort of that motivational force moves us to do something do something. Um, and he, of course, very famously believed that many of these drives, many of the things that move us to do things, we are not even aware of. They reside deeply in our unconscious and they push us um, to engage in certain behaviors. So fascinating character. Um, let's carry on. <clears throat> so when he was talking about these psychic energies, um, he ultimately came to the conclusion that, that there were sort of three entities in the mind and that these three entities interacted in a very um, dynamic way. So it literally became known as psychodynamics, psychodynamic theory. These three entities were the id, the ego, and the superego. So um, let's contrast the id and the superego and then we'll come, in, we'll come to the ego and make it make sense. So Freud was German. The word id literally means it. Um, and think of, you know, if, you're, if you want to talk about an animal in a beastly way, you will sometimes refer to it as an it. It's a thing, right? It's not, it's not like a human being. It's a thing. Um, he kind of thought of that same way with the id, that it was our primal basis, the most primal self, um, and that it wanted things. And when it wanted things, it wanted things now, immediate gratification. Uh, and so it had desires, and those desires could be, um, we've talked about these before, but a desire to be warm, a desire to be well fed. But it could be a desire for sex. It could be a desire to hit somebody that's annoying you. Um, all of these kinds of things, you know, think in a very animalistic nature where an animal, you know, you poke an animal with a stick enough, it's going to attack you. Um, that's the sort of world in which the id was thought to live. So very basic, very primal, um, had basic desires and wanted those desires fulfilled right now. Now, the complication of humanity, Freud thought, is that we are not all beasts living in individual caves. If we were, the id might be enough. But we group together, we live in societies, we work with other human beings, we live with other human beings, and as a result of that, we need social rules, social conventions, laws, as it were, uh, but not even necessarily laws. It, you know, laws could be the formal um, set of socio sociologically um, agreed upon rules, but we also have a less formal set of rules just based on what we all consider proper conduct, proper behavior. And so Freud thought all of those kind of rules are um, captured in what he called the superego. 
and that in fact what the super ego had was in this desire for us to be the kind of person that really fit well in society the kind of person that other people admired and respected and looked up to uh, and so that kind of person cannot be beastly that kind of person has to follow the rules of society and behave within those rules to gain the respect and adoration if you go hitting people when you want or you go um, you know luring at people you find sexually interesting or worse yet grabbing you know trying to satisfy sexual desires just because they came upon you you are never going to be respected and admired in your um, social world so the super ego in a sense keeps the beast in check it keeps well it's actually what the ego does the super ego represents this other us this supreme us the us that we would like other people to think of us as so we have this primal nature and then we have this illustrious goal of the person we would like to be um, and then we have the ego and the ego's job almost like a referee in a sense is to get between these two psychodynamic forces these psychodynamic entities and to try to find ways in which the ego, sorry, the id can be satisfied without compromising this superego notion of the person we want to be. Notice with the superego, we have conscience um, associated with this. And the idea here is, you know, every now and then we fail. We, we behave in ways that are more beastly, are more primitive and are, are things that we might consider embarrassing if other people knew about it. We wouldn't want people knowing we, we behaved in that, that way, or we hope that nobody finds out we did, or we feel guilty for something we did. Um, all of those notions are associated with the superego, that if you do something, even if you get away with it, and nobody sees you, you still have this fear that you will be found out. Um, and if you think of that fear, what is that fear? Well, it's ultimately, you know, people think I'm a pretty decent human being. But if they only knew this, they would think less of me. So my, my ideal image of myself would be tarnished. And, and so we hope that never happens and we're worried that will happen. And all those feelings of guilt, all, all that sense of conscience is part of the superego and trying to preserve that image. Okay, And so the ego is trying to get between these things and, and, and kind of you know saying to the id, okay, I know you want this and this and this and this, but we can't just give you exactly what you want because we'll compromise Mr. Ideal over here. And so let me see if I can figure out ways you can get what you want and yet we can preserve our sense of being a good person. All right? So that there's this battle always going on. Not a battle, but a negotiation let's say between these forces and this can come out in our behavior can come out in our personality all right so to do this a little bit more um, I think I've done a lot of this but let's just go through this quickly so the id is considered this dark dark is kind of a strange word I, I prefer more primitive because I don't know um, so this primitive, inaccessible part of our personality. So, and actually, these are Freud's words, so we should go with it, because part of Freud's popularity is that he was a really good writer. He wrote in ways that people went, whoa, that sounds cool. So, the dark, inaccessible part of our personality, a cauldron full of seething excitations, filled with energy reaching it from the instincts, but it has no organization, produces no conscious will, but only a striving to bring about that satisfaction of the instinctual needs subject to the pleasure principle. So it's I want, I want, I want, I want. That's, that's sort of what the id um, is about. So the pleasure principle is the desire to obtain immediate gratification in whatever form it may take. So, yeah. So think of that, and if you're, you're feeling angry, you're feeling aggressive, you just want to hit something, and you want to hit it now. Um, that's the id talking. Um, the id's also linked to lim the libido, um, which is often thought of in Freudian terms as the primary source of instinctual motivation for literally all psychic forces. So everything comes from your libido. All right, so that's the id. 
Again, the superego, conscience, we already did this, but it's charged with the task of making you the sort of person that will fit in well with society. Or just the person you would like to be. So maybe you're comfortable not fitting in with society, but you still want to be a certain kind of person. You want certain kind of attributes. You value certain kind of attributes. So that's the person you're striving to be. Um, associated with the superego are these two things. The ego ideal, which is exactly that internalized notion of what society values in a person, what it means to be good, liked, or appreciated. So we all have this sense of you know, that person, and we measure everybody up against that ideal. And conscience is the in, uh, internalization of rules and restrictions of society, punishes wrongdoings, and gives you feelings of guilt. Okay, so that's where guilt comes from. And finally, the ego. Um, so it fi tries to find ways to satisfy the id without invoking guilt from the superego. Um, it defers to the reality principle. So this is in comparison with the pleasure principle. Um, the reality principle is the tendency to satisfy the id's desires in realistic ways. So in ways that don't um, mess up the superego and get us all feeling guilty and, and worried and all that kind of stuff. Now, within all of this, so if you accept those forces interacting, um, and especially when you kind of think of the superego, once again, Freud focused on sexual and aggressive dr drives as especially important. Um, and the reason for that was because it's those drives that have the most societal rules associated with them. Uh, and especially during Freudian time, he lived in Victorian times where um, Men were supposed to be gentlemen. Ladies were supposed to be um, ladies. They were, you know, covered f basically neck to foot. Um, there was very little public touching. There was very little discussion of, of sexuality at all. Um, it was all behind closed doors. Everybody was supposed to behave in very proper ways. Uh, and so within this context, Freud said, okay, so now we have a lot of stress because that primitive being inside of us wants sex at certain times with certain people and it wants it now uh, and the aggressive sides of us want to be aggressive towards certain people and and they want to be aggressive now but we can't in either case act directly on those urges those desires if we do we will compromise the super ego in extreme ways um, we will become known as this um, creep think of that word creep you know, will become known as a creep. If, even if you just lure at every person you find sexually attractive, if you stare at them and say, oh man, I wish, I wish. And if you do that to every person you see, people are going to go, what a freaking creepoid you are, right? And that's the super, and you'll feel that. And you'll feel that people think I'm a jerk. They think I'm an idiot. They think whatever. I mean, if anybody even gets caught doing it that a little bit out of the corner of their eye, they feel that feeling, right? And so that's the tension between the society rules and behaviors that involve sexual and aggressive uh, drives. So that's why sex and aggression became such a big part of what Freud talked about. Uh, and of course, that also made um, it fascinating reading. So people found this stuff fascinating. All right. Um, just to kind of follow through on Freud a little bit, of course, he also thought that this sort of internal battle, much of which is unconscious, gives rise to the behaviors, gives rise to your personality, who you are. But to the extent you don't like certain of your behaviors, certain aspects of your personality, maybe you're socially anxious and you hate that. You get around a bunch of people and you're really like, why am I always so socially anxious? Why am I doing stuff? Well, Freud would probably say, well, there are some deep-rooted things going on inside your head. There is stuff that happened to you at various points of time that you are not even aware of, but it is somehow... Um, causing you this, this anxiety and if we can only get to what that problem is then we can deal with it but until we figure out what is actually causing this this behavioral symptom we cannot address it wow I sound like Herbert Kronzucker there um, that's my best Freud uh, but literally that was Freud's notion just like a virus gives rise to symptoms if you want to get rid of the symptoms you got to kill the virus Freud thought that maladaptive behavior, 
problematic behavior reflected some internal psychological virus, some psychic conflict. And you have to get to that conflict, figure it out, um, and, and deal with it. And if you deal with it, the symptoms will dissipate. But you don't get hung up on the symptoms, you got to get to the internal conflict. The problem is the internal conflict is typically something you're not aware of. More than that, Freud said, it's often something you don't want to remember or think about. So that he thought there were active forces to keep these things that cause these traumas out of our consciousness, to keep them buried. And so that makes them really hard to find, right? Um, especially if the person really doesn't want to deal with it or doesn't want to find it. So Freud tried to, a lot of his techniques, a lot of his therapeutic techniques are attempts to get at that internal psycho psychological conflict in indirect ways because you can't just ask people direct questions if you ask them like let's say let, let's be a little more extreme let's say Freud thought somebody might have been sexually abused when they were young by a family member per perhaps um, he thought that could explain some of the symptomology if he just says I think you were sexually abused maybe by a father or uncle or something like that what do you think of that your, your answer would be no, no, absolutely not, no, not, not, not even possible. That is, all these defenses would come up. You would never want to believe that. You would never want to think that. And suddenly a wall comes up that gets in the way of the therapist. They'll never be able to get at it that way. So they have to use roundabout ways of, of getting to that point and making you go, oh, my gosh. I was sexually abused. I remember now. So that's what he called catharsis. He's trying to get you to catharsis where you actually brought that thing to consciousness, but you really have to ease it in. You have to get at it in very subtle ways. You can't go at it directly. So one of his techniques that he's very well known for was called dream analysis. He believed that when we dream, all of these defense mechanisms, all of these things that try to keep things out of consciousness um, are less alert. So the guards are sleeping, so to speak, or the guards are busy or something like that. And so that a lot of the things, the underlying conflicts would play out in our dreams. But they would play out in disguised form. They wouldn't play out directly. Um, so let's say somebody's father sexually abused them. Um, one of the things we might expect, or Freud would probably expect, is that later in life they would have a lot of trust issues in relationships. They would worry that anybody they're with um, really, um, well, is going to at some point in time um, disappoint them or do something nasty to them because that's sort of what the father did, right? Or the uncle did. So he might think that. Um, and, and you might have this underlying conflict that's playing out and, and causing you to have trouble in relationships. He would think that when you're dreaming, you'll see clues to that conflict. So you wouldn't dream about being sexually abused by your father. But you might dream dreams where you're continually relying on somebody or somebody important to you um, does things that really disappoint you or hurt you in, in ways. So that the theme that underlying theme would be there, but it would be played out in all different kind of context. So in the dreams, his famous book, Interpretation of Dreams, you can check out, it's great reading. Um, he d distinguished it between what he called the manifest content and the latent content. The manifest content is what you actually see in your dream, what you experience in your dream. So that's what manifests, what appears in your dream. Uh, and he thought the superego was at work there. That's why you don't just remember the actual event that's causing the, the conflict. Rather, it gets disguised by the superego in, into something else. So you don't quite have to confront it, even in a dream. But he thought if you analyzed a bunch of dreams and you looked at the themes of what was going on, that you could potentially get at the common thread underlying a variety of dreams, a variety of manifest content might be linked to the same latent content, the same true story that's underneath all the disguised stories. And if you could get at that, then you could start to uncover this psychic conflict. So Freud used dreams a lot um, as a 
as it said here, a royal road, royal road to the unconscious, that it could lead you to this, this stuff. And of course, lots of people um, like to engage in, in dream analysis. Now, before I go any further, because it's going to get even weirder from here, um, before I go any further, I want to be very, very clear that if you paid attention to the way I've been speaking of Freud, I've been saying things like Freud believed or Freud argued, or a theory that Freud proposed. Um, this is the way a scientist in, in psychology speaks of Freud. And even using the word theory is a little tricky because, again, the problem with Freud and the reason he caused so much tension within the psychology world is that he was very comfortable just creating these complex stories um, of unconscious forces and all the stuff you, you've heard about so far and the stuff you're about to hear about with very little direct evidence um, and in fact most of his stories if you think of them as theories or you try to think of them as scientific theories they don't lead to predictions you can test his his stories are so complex that any behavior you see a human do you can come up with a Freudian type explanation of it which means it can explain anything which means you can never show that it's wrong. And any theory that cannot be disproven is not a good scientific theory. So most scientists um, find Freud dangerous, really, because he's saying a bunch of things that feel compelling, that we all think, yeah, that sounds right, that sounds cool, that sounds interesting. Um, but maybe have no scientific basis. So some people will say Freud is more like a science fiction writer um, than he is a scientist. So keep that in mind. Everything I'm saying is it's, I'm not telling you the truth about human behavior here. I'm telling you Freud's opinions, Freud's theories, Freud's ideas. Okay. So with that in mind, let's move on to the way he would interpret things. So Freud thought there were, there were all these defense mechanisms. So these were sort of tools, I guess you could say, that were things that the ego could use as it tried to satisfy the id in ways that didn't offend the superego. Hope you have all that kind of thing now. Um, so in some cases, these are kind of blunt tools. So. Um, repression is just a very blunt tool for saying there's certain things it just keeps out of our mind, certain things about ourselves. So let's say we find, I don't know, I'm trying to think of some crazy fetish, absolute fetish. <laughs> let's say that we find cell phones incredibly hot. <laughs> we see somebody, there must be somebody out there by now, I haven't heard of the you hear of the word philia, like pedophilia, people who find children, pediatric children, sexually attractive. We call that pedophilia. There must be a smartphone ophelia by now. Um, but let's say this, this really, you did find this sexually exciting. Every smartphone you see, you find, you know, it turns you on, really. Um, but that's something that might be so weird, you would never admit it to yourself. Uh, and so one of the things you might do is repress that from your mind. You might have psychological um, things, uh, processes that keep you from ever really realizing or knowing that you find phones sexually attractive. You still do, but you will never consciously be aware of the true source of those feelings. So you might just become a super geek that has to see the newest smartphone all the time and whatever, um, but you're never really thinking of it in sexual terms, although ultimately, you know, that could be where the drive is coming from. So repression's a blunt one. Um, you're gonna read about a lot of these, so I'm going to um, allow you to kind of go through some of these and, and think about them because they're kind of cool. Let me do one, though, just to give you a more, um, well, you know, it's, it's got a bunch of these here. So, so let's, I don't know. I like my favorite. Um, so the sublimation is one of my favorites, I guess. Sublimation is pretty gentle, though. Sublimation just says we can take energies and redirect them. And so basically anybody who's artistic in any way or 
it doesn't have to be art. This example might be, um, you know, athletics or whatever that you take some impulse that's that's inappropriate from a society standpoint, and you find an appropriate way to satisfy that by changing it a little bit. So one example I like to sometimes um, talk about is is things like guitars. Um, because I like guitars, but guitars have lots of curves, or lots of you know the the shape of a guitar. Um, there, there we do this, but why not? The shape of a guitar tends to be. Um, let me do images. Tends to be kind of curvy. Not always though. There's an interesting di dichotomy we can do here. But so if you look at some of these guitars, now think of the female body. Think of somebody who has this desire to touch the female bodies all the time but obviously you can't do that right you can't go into society and go oh there's a nice curvy female body I would like to touch that you can't but you could decide to become something called a luthier a luthier is somebody who creates guitars or various other stringed instruments um, in this case a violin so you're building these guitars but part of building the guitar is having your hands all over the guitars working with the shape of the guitar um, you know here's somebody with their hands all over a guitar in a different way um, but you're actually constantly surrounded by these shapes you're thinking about these shapes you're, sh you're creating these shapes uh, working with them in all sorts of ways uh, this could be a way of sublimating that desire by producing beautiful guitars. Now one of the other funny things about guitars that I'll mention is sometimes when people talk about especially electric guitars they will classify them as in two ways. You have your what some people would say feminine guitars with a lot of curvy shapes um, but you also have your more masculine guitars. You're more what some would call it phallic guitars. Okay pointy, edgy, strong, manly, um, and there's some claim that you know people use their guitars to express their personality in different ways. Some people like curvy kind of guitars, which is kind of like playing a woman, but other people might like edgy kind of um, guitars because they are an extension of your masculinity in, in guitar form. All right, This is all sort of a Freudian way of speaking. Um, give you one other kind of um, fun example and there's different ways people do this reaction formation so here's one that you have but let me cons let me throw the following at you because this is one of my favorite examples it's um all right let's say this you are born into a religious family that has very strong moral attitudes about sexuality and um, the last thing you would ever do explicitly within your family is do something like watch pornography okay that would be considered really wrong really evil only one problem you like pornography <laughs> you enjoy watching pornography and at some point in your life the id is like I want pornography I want pornography it's right there it's right on the edge of your fingertips just go search will you just go do it um, how do you survive in that situation where you have this deep desire to view pornography but you live in a situation where that's considered wrong or inappropriate ah well here's an approach I could become a crusader against pornography so publicly I am going to be out there saying how evil how terrible pornography is how degrading it is why it must be banished from the planet um, but of course if I'm going to do this, I have to know what I'm talking about, right? I, I can't just talk about pornography, never seeing it, and talk about how horrible and how degrading and how, how it is if I've, if I've never actually seen it. So now, obviously, I have to view pornography. I have to watch it because I have to watch it to know what I'm talking about. I can use examples of you know the horrible things that are happening that I've seen. So what have I just done? Well, I've come up with a way of pleasuring both things my id gets to watch the pornography my super ego gets to feel okay about me watching the pornography I've come up with a, a, a rationality for doing that um, so some of these could be almost in the rationalization camp but but that's usually called reaction formation because I'm, I'm I'm kind of reacting the opposite I, I, I 
want pornography, I like pornography, but what I'm saying, what I'm expressing outwardly is that I hate it and it's evil. And that's the socially acceptable thing to say. And yet I'm still satisfying my id. All right. So that I love that example because it really shows how the how the ego could maybe cleverly balance these two forces. And this is the kind of thing Freud talked a lot about. So he would watch somebody and he would say, oh, yes, I think you're just projecting there. Or I think, oh, that's a great example of sublimation. Now, notice, by the way, that sublimation is good. So Freud didn't think that all of these manners for these forces to escape were, were bad or maladaptive. We want nice guitars out there. We want beautiful art, which he often saw as the artist's way of expressing sexual or aggressive desires in art. Um, Think of punk rock. Punk rock's pretty darned aggressive. Metal is often pretty darned aggressive. It's a way of channeling that aggression through music and connecting with people on that level in socially acceptable ways. So some of these are not problems. Some of them, though, become problems. Okay. So all this to say Th Freud's ideas run much deeper than clinical psychology. They're about human behavior in general. All right, so now let's get to the really controversial. If you thought any of this was controversial, it's about to get more controversial because um, we'll now talk about Freud's psychosexual theory. So it should be psychosexual, not psychosexual there, uh, of personality development. So finally, we're going to get to the personality relevance here uh, because Freud thought <clears throat> a lot of the um, things that set up who you are are set up based on your transition through a number of critical stages that everybody goes through. These stages, he felt, were, were associated with so-called erogenous zones, um, parts of our body that, when stimulated, give us sensual pleasure, sensual pleasure that's, that's more than, than we get when, our, when we scratch our hand. Okay, so heightened sensual pleasure. So these are erogenous zones, and he thought they were very important. You know, they, they are kind of interesting when you think of it. We have this body, most of which is just a body, which is normal, but certain parts of it are, are different, are special. Um, and, and so Freud kind of latched onto that, and he thought, well, maybe they're really special, and came up with this theory around it. So specifically, he saw these stages. Again, think kind of Piaget-like. So remember, Piaget had these stages of cognitive development, and a child could not... Um, move on until they've mastered certain things at a given stage. Freud's going to think the same way, but it's going to be psychosexual psycho development. So little stages we go through, and again, sometimes we don't get through the stages pretty well. We can become fixated at a stage, um, and that will come through in our personality and our behavior if, if that happens. Okay, so, so in this case, the fixation, as suggested here, doesn't prevent us from moving on, but it stays with us. It kind of shows through in our adult personalities. All right, what are we talking about? Well, let's start with the mouth. We can talk about different parts, parts of the body because that's literally um, you know, how Freud thought about it. So Freud said right from a young child, right from birth, um, Infants are receiving gratification. So if we think of the id, what does the id want in an infant? Well, the id wants food, mostly. Um, that, that's the primal sort of thing that it's driven towards. And how does it get its food? Through its mouth. Uh, and the notion is that, this, that the mouth is a very critical part. Now, here's one of the things that's going to make Freud's theory is controversial, but it's important that you understand the way Freud uses the term sexual. In fact, I think it would have been better if he used the word sensual um, because he's talking about sensual feelings, um, but he does keep them linked to sex as we think of it as a grown-up, and, and that's what made this theory so controversial because he's saying that a child, even a baby, even you know months-old child, is receiving sensual slash sexual stimulation from feeding and, and it's getting this stimulation through its mouth so when it feeds it feels satisfied uh, and so yeah sensual but also 
a hint of that more sexual thing, and that's like pretty freaky, right? What you're saying? This kid has sexual urges. This this child and Freud saying, "Yes, I think it does." And we're like, whoa. Um, that's why he says things, um, y- you see things like thumb sucking, which we even saw uh, in utero, that, that the baby is, is th- thumb sucking, but babbling, and that the, the mouth is really critical. And it's getting a lot of stimulation from its mouth in this zero to two years old age. Okay, And if, if you don't get over that, then you might become, oh, a professor maybe. <laughs> <laughs> somebody who wants to talk all the time and use their mouth all the time or you could become a professional wine taster um, again not necessarily a bad thing but but somebody who could be orally fixated we call this that you're still and and you see you know older people who um, especially women who might chew their hair right and have their hair in their mouth or people who bite their fingernails the claim is they're still getting a lot of stimulation from their mouth it's still a primary pleasure they haven't quite moved on from the mouth they're orally fixated okay but again speakers people who use it singers um, people who use their mouth a lot and seem to to continue to be getting enjoyment out of that would be said to be a little orally fixate fixated okay anal next step when a child gets to be about two or three years old a major thing happens to it and 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 I think there is absolutely something to this this is in Freud's mind the first time the child comes head-on in contact with society because suddenly it's being asked to inhibit behavior specifically pooing its pants crapping crapping its pants so up until you know roughly two years old we just let kids pee and poo anytime they want go ahead we got diapers on you don't worry about it pee and poo whenever you want Uh, but then at some point around two we start to say you know what there's rules about this um, grown-ups, adults, do not pee or poo in their pants. That is now unacceptable behavior. You're supposed to go to the toilet. We're going to train you how to do this. And suddenly the superego raises its ugly head that if the child is supposed to use the washroom in the toilet but doesn't, fails for whatever reason, wets its pants, um, you know, pees its bed at night, what what does that child what are they rewarded with shame guilt right because you're not supposed to do that so now we have this very id like desire you know i feel like i got a crap and the and the, <laughs> and the id would just say go for it and now suddenly we have the super ego come in the picture say no 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 don't go for it get your butt out of bed <laughs> literally i guess get to the washroom and do it in the society acceptable way so how quickly does a child learn this now this is often seen as being linked of course you know why does society want you to do it this way well because it suddenly is considered dirty to just let go in your pants right that's what most of us think like if anybody did that in class beside you you'd be like oh gross that's disgusting and you know all this disgust would come out it's dirty Um, and so People who get fixated on the anal stage are are often said to be overly concerned about neatness, tidiness, um, everything being clean, so that if you had issues with the anal stage and you never quite got through it right, people will say of a grown-up, oh man, that person is anal retentive, or they're anally fixated, or they're anal, we'll just use the word anal. And what we mean by that is everything has to be a set way, everything has to be neat and tidy, and that's like they've never quite gotten over and past that, they're still fixated on the anal stage, okay? Two to three years old, the child goes through that. All right. Three to seven years old is what's called the phallic stage. And this is um, when children start to truly understand that there is a physiological difference between males and females. Uh, And, you know, in Freud's very strong way of describing this, um, that that continues to this day, you'll hear this quite a bit, um, he kind of described it as men have something women don't. Okay? Uh, And that children learn this. Children learn that males have a phallus, females do not um, and that with that comes power authority that males tend to especially in the Victoria time Victorian era but even today tend to have more power more authority more strength 
Um, and so the notion is there's something to that that phallus. So we talked about phallic symbols, you know, guitars, like I say, somebody who wanted that pointy guitar, the notion would be like they're still kind of into this situation. They're still kind of hooked into that retention, retentive at, fixated at this stage where things are all about the phallus. Um, this is where, by the way, the, the term penis envy also originates. The idea was that girls at this stage um, started to feel ripped off. <laughs> like, why did, I didn't get one of those. Why didn't I get one of those? That's not fair. And that they literally feel a certain envy towards boys for, for having a penis that they don't have. Uh, so that's the notion of penis envy. Okay, That's at the phallic stage. Three to seven. All right. It's also where they start to become aware of sexuality, the way society thinks about sexuality. But of course, Freud would say they're sexual from birth. Um, but they're kind of thinking the the, the male sense. Um, all right. So now we're at the seven eleven year old. This is the sort of latency. This doesn't really factor very strongly in, in Freud's theory. So he says between 7 and 11, basically from 7 years old till the beginning of adolescence, to the beginning of puberty, the child just continues to grow up, continues to develop, um, but generally they kind of, yeah, stay at the stage. So it's kind of a boring stage. So we'll skip it and go on to the genital stage. Um, 11 to adult or sort of puberty to adult, wherever you want to, you know, he, Freud marks it quite early, starting already at 11. Um, and the suggestion is that at this age, they start to really kind of think about the opposite sex in, um, in the ways we think of sexuality. So they get interested in genitalia, um, but that they literally, um, yeah, they start to de deal maturely, it says here, with the opposite sex. Um, I don't know if it, can, can you be fixated at the genital stage? I guess, I guess Freud would say we all are, or at least until such a point as your testosterone drops and your sexual urges disappear. So, you know, we're all, you guys certainly would all be still in this stage of psychosexual development where we're... Um, genitals are on your mind <laughs> a lot where you're we're in a, in a sexual sense now some of you are saying like they are not what the heck and I mean that was the reaction to Freud as well I mean he's very out there with a lot of this stuff right and in fact if we kind of go n next word this is what really kind of got a lot of people upset and this is going to bring us back to the Doors song in a little bit so um Freud said that as children are going through these psychosexual um, stages, they can also develop these complexes that they're called, the, the Oedipus complex and the Electra complex. Um, the Oedipus complex says that, um, yeah, boys form close bonds with their mothers and become both jealous and fearful at their fathers. So the claim is, you know, as a very young child, children are attracted to their mother. So this is, this is Jim Morrison. You know, with his ma mother, I would like to have sexual relations with you. Um, so that's the claim, that, that when they're young, that there is this dual notion of being attracted to your mother, um, but also being jealous of the power and authority of the other male, um, the father. So the father gets time with the mother that, that you don't get. And so the claim is that some kids go through this stage of being really tightly connected with their mother. Um, and, and again, Freud is like going to that sexual, sensual side of that extreme and being jealous and scared of their father as, and, and almost seeing their father as a competitor for the affections of the mother. And he thought people could kind of get stuck with this complex. They could kind of, that that could stay with them all through their life and could affect their relationships with both men and women, um, obviously. They could continue to see every male as a competitor for the affection of the women in their life. The electric complex, the notion was that girls also become especially close to their fathers and envy their mothers, um, and that penis envy can make this especially strong in a young girl. So, I mean, like, look at this picture of this young girl and try to connect that with the text to the side of it, and you'll see why society did and continues to find Freud completely provocative. 
but you know he is actually suggesting that young girls get attracted to their fathers and see their mothers now as a competitor and it could be especially strong in females because their dads have that thing of power that their mothers don't have um, and so access to that becomes important yeah so Freud thought everybody has these feelings but for many people these feelings are resolved more in that latency period where there is a period of identification um, so that so the notion is that as the child becomes a little older let's say a, let's say a male child they stop at some point seeing their father as a competitor and they start seeing them as a colleague of a sort a same-sex parent and and they do things together they do guy things together um, and at some point the the child identifies with the father and wants to be the kind of father uh, and so stop seeing them as a competitor and sees them more as a role model similarly with with females and at that point the claim is their um, attraction attraction is too strong of a word but that it shifts so they leave this sort of half sexual attractive nature for the opposite sex parent and instead start identifying with the same sex parent and and finding them um, yeah a role model I guess I'll say uh, and meanwhile, the super ego is developing in all this. You're, you're learning the rules that you do not, children do not have relationships of that sort with their parents. They're supposed to have it with other individuals. And so all of this is developing as the child is developing. Crazy, hey? Really crazy. All right. Well, that's all, that's all I have. But, le but let me just say, let's go back to this one as a closing thing. Now that you've heard a lot of the story about development, imagine it being told in the Victorian era where people don't talk about sex or didn't talk about sex until Freud comes along and not only does he talk about sex but he's not talking about this person and that person doing something they shouldn't be doing behind closed doors he's talking about kids and parents he's talking about kids having s sexual sensual desires from the moment of birth um, he is really, you know, taken this, this barrier and gone three miles beyond it. And I think that explains why Freud had the, the impact he did on psychology. Everybody knew these theories. It's kind of like that, how many ever shades of gray? I don't know, 50 shades of gray, is it? Whatever. Uh, but 50 shades of gray, we live in a, in a society nowadays where people can say, yeah, okay, I understand that women have sexual desires and they could enjoy reading this sort of weird kind of stuff that we didn't think they actually liked, but I guess some of them do. But even that's not nearly as extreme as Freud. So suddenly, you know, people started hearing these ideas and reading these papers and sharing these papers, and it was like, oh my goodness what is this guy saying and everybody knew the ideas and all these scientists the psychology science geeks working in their labs um, doing gestalt psychology and trying to figure out how things group together to form perception um, suddenly Freud defined the field of psychology but he defined it in a non-scientific way um, and really in so doing he fractured psychology um, in, into two separate areas, one that's much more scientifically minded and the other in which became much more clinically minded. So therapies guided by Freud's ideas that were meant to help people who were showing disordered behavior that th theoretically came about because of some of these processes Freud was talking about. And he was the only game in town at the time. There's many more games in town now. Um, but that psychodynamic theory you know, really ruled the day for a while in clinical psychology. So I hope you have a sense of all that now, and I will leave this lecture here. Um, see you later. Have a good week. Hope it's not too cold. Sorry. <laughs>